Cross it. Hey everybody, Dr. O here. Welcome to chapter 11. So we just got done talking about the water-soluble vitamins. Now we are talking about the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, and K. So before we come, we jump in a couple things. We covered some of this in the last chapter, but remember, fat-soluble vitamins, you need dietary fat to absorb them. So you need bile to be released in response to dietary fat. And then as these long chain fats are absorbed, so are the fat soluble vitamins. And they're actually carried then on the lipoproteins like LDL and HDL that carry triglycerides and those kind of things around the blood. So you do need dietary fat in order to get your fat soluble vitamins. Um, I generally recommend making sure you have at least eight grams of fat in a meal if you're trying to uh, maximize the absorption of the fat soluble vitamins. I think more is, more is better from, from that standpoint. But again, fats are very calorie dense and you have to decide how they fit in your diet. But if you're eating the AMDR or acceptable macronutrient distribution range of fats, which is 20, 20 to 35% of your calories, then you're, you should have plenty of fat in your meals. But keep this in mind, like, Let's say you have a bowl of cereal, I, example I used last chapter, but a bowl of cereal with skim milk for bre breakfast. Or you have a salad, but you don't put salad dressing on it, these types of things. Remember that your fat soluble nutrients like vitamins A, D, E, and K, and like the carotenoids that we'll talk about here in this chapter, they need that fat to be absorbed. So just because a food says it has fat soluble vitamins doesn't mean you're actually going to get any value out of them or any use out of them if there's no fat along for the ride. So just be careful with meals that don't have any fat. But at the same time, fat soluble vitamins are stored in a way that most, almost all water soluble vitamins are not. So that means that you don't need to absorb them at every meal. Okay, um, just a couple things to consider there. The other thing I want to talk about besides the, the need for dietary fat is the fact that I think it's true with all nutrients. There's lots of synergy, lots of relationships that nutrients have with each other. But to me, I always try to look at the fat soluble vitamins as a group. So vitamins A, D, E, and K. Um, it, se it seems to be a lot better for you if you increase your intake of all of them rather than individual ones. So you have, you know, some people take vitamin E as an antioxidant. Some people take vitamin D. Every, everyone hears about how good vitamin D is. But um, so, pe so sometimes people take individual nutrients. But I found that it's better to to get these from whole foods, like any other nutrient. And when you generally, when you find them in food, uh, you're going to find them in combination with each other. So I, I just think that don't let these get out of whack. Like if you if you take a bunch of extra B vitamins, it won't really impact vitamin C or other nutrients. But these these seem to all kind of play and, and work together. Just a couple little things to consider. All right. So an icebreaker. Do you have a favorite vegetable? Um, mine's broccoli for sure. Uh, what vitamins? Well, well, maybe not anymore. <laughs> not, that, not that you need to care about that, but because you're thinking about it for yourself. But uh, I broccoli used to be, but now I really like broccoli sprouts. So we have a hydroponic garden, so we do a lot of uh, we do a lot of sprouts, and uh, so broccoli sprouts are now my favorite. I like I really like kohlrabi sprouts as well. Uh, wheatgrass kind of good, but uh, yeah, I would say broccoli sprouts are my number one now. But what vitamins do you think the vegetables might supply? I mean, we, you know, we'll talk about that, but generally you think about um, uh, when I think of vegetables, I think of things like vitamin K and beta carotene and, and the like. Uh, broccoli sprouts, I specifically like those because they're really high in a phytochemical called sulforaphane that is very good for you. Uh, does this affect your choice of what to eat? Why or why not? So when you decide, what, when you go to the store and you decide what vegetables to eat, um, are you thinking about the, their nutritional qualities? Are you thinking about what nutrients they may be adding to your diet? Or are you thinking about something else? Well, I mean, that's that's for you to decide, but I guess the answer is you should, right? Yeah, the, you know, the, the nutrients that are in the food you eat should impact your choice of whether to eat them or not, especially if you track your diet and you know where you might be lacking in some nutrients, then finding specific foods to fill those gaps is a really, really good idea. All right, learning objectives, you'll see they're, 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 they say the same thing here, but for the four nutrients we're going to cover. So identify the main roles, deficiency symptoms, and food sources for vitamins A, D, E, and K. I don't want to read that sentence four times. All right, let's start with vitamin A and beta carotene. Remember from last chapter that beta carotene is what's known as a precursor. So it's not an essential nutrient. Beta carotene can become vitamin A, and that's why we have the, the discussion here. And it's really important to know that because when you look at foods they will often talk about their vitamin A content and them being high in vitamin A. But if you look at them with plant-based foods, but they actually are high in is beta carotene, which needs to be converted to vitamin A. So we'll come back to that. Um, that's why you might see that some, some nutrients will say they, or some foods will say they have preformed vitamin A, meaning they actually already have vitamin A in that. Whereas other foods will say that they're a good source of vitamin A, but what they really are is a good source of beta carotene. All right, uh, vitamin A's roles in the body. So remember, I have a couple of my little sheets here with some FDA documents and one that I put together that I'm going to add a few things here. 
Uh, so we just talked about how vitamin A and beta carotene. So beta carotene can become vitamin A. Um, I don't, you know, uh, some genetic studies have shown that up to 30 plus percent of people have a really hard time converting beta carotene to vitamin A. I think this is why we see so much vitamin A deficiency globally. What last number I saw, 124 million children are vitamin A deficient, but they're often eating foods that have beta carotene. So a couple of issues there. Um, number one, Beta-carotene is a carotenoid, and carotenoids are fat-soluble just like vitamin A. So if you're consuming a lot of foods with beta-carotene but there's not any fat in the meal, then the absorption is going to be decreased by about 500%. So, so it's a major, major difference. So in lots of parts of the world, people are eating foods that have beta-carotene, but no fat in that meal it's going to impair the absorption so most of it would be kind of passing through them and by, you know to me the preformed vitamin a is the way to go i i try not to ask the human body to do conversions when it doesn't need to because these conversions are inefficient right well, let's say you're one of those 30 plus percent of people and you don't convert beta carotene to vitamin a very well well you're better off consuming vitamin a so we'll talk about where it comes from uh so i just mentioned the absorption and the conversion Collectively, the vitamin A is known as what are called the retinoids. We have retinol, retinal, and retinoic acid, and they each have their own function. I'll show you a little picture in a minute here, but retinol is what we need for vision. Retinal supports reproduction and is the major transport and storage form. So we'll look at uh, one of the main functions of vitamin A being invo involving reproductive health. And then retinoic acid regulates cell differentiation, growth, and embryonic development, so also growth and reproduction. But this is where uh, the, the immune functions of vitamin A come from, too. When I think of vitamin A, the first thing I think of is vision. The second thing I think of is, is your immune system. A, a vitamin A deficiency can decrease um, some, some antimicrobial peptides in your body by as much as 30 or 35%. So this is, it's, a, it's a very, very big deal. If I'm looking at critical nutrients to improve immune function, uh, vitamin A and vitamin D are both really, really high up on that list, as is uh, zinc is another one that I think is really, really important. Okay, uh, before we get to the forms, let me just kind of talk about what I have on my little document here. So we talked about the, the different roles. So the two primary roles are vision and immune function is what I see, and then the growth and reproduction stuff. I have noted, and it'll come up in the slides, but I just want to make sure I cover it all. Deficiencies cause night blindness. So if I ask you what the most common symptom of vitamin A deficiency is, it's definitely night blindness, and that's because... We need, uh, retin we need vitamin A to, to make the compounds that are involved in vision. If you don't have enough of those, you really don't notice when there's plenty of light because uh, you, the, your vision is inefficient, but there's more than enough light to make up for it. But when you get in the dark, when you get into lower light situations, that's when you can see that you don't have enough vitamin A for proper vision. <clears throat> so night blindness is a key one there. I already mentioned that the fat soluble vitamins, they all work synergistically. Uh, food sources, I'll give you my list, but you'll see the books list in a moment. The best food sources by far are animal products, including organ meats, and that's because uh, that's because animal products have the preformed vitamin A, not asking your body to convert beta carotene to vitamin A. Uh, the best sources are liver and turkey giblets or giblets. I actually don't know how to say that. Um, eggs and dairy. Uh, we talked about, all right, uh, you must have dietary fat in the meal to absorb the fat cell vitamins. So I talked about that. What's the FDA document say? Uh, functions of vitamin A, growth and development, immune function, reproduction, red blood cell formation, skin and bone formation, and vision. So clearly an important nutrient. Uh, our daily value is 5,000 IUs or international units. And then where is it found? So you, you'll see here a list of of foods that have actually vitamin A and have beta carotene. So cantaloupe, carrots, those would have beta carotene. Uh, you notice that they're orange. That's usually a good a good source of beta carotene. Dairy products, eggs, fortified cereals, where, think, where either beta carotene or vitamin A would be added. Green leafy vegetables like spinach and broccoli. Pumpkin, red peppers, and sweet potatoes. So that's the FDA's list of good sources of vitamin A, but don't forget that some of those actually have beta carotene and they're trusting the conversion. All right, so here we see retinol, retinal, retinoic acid. We just mentioned them, but at the bottom we have beta carotene. So how does this actually work? Sometimes cle oh, so so you cleave it, you take a beta carotene and split it in half. That will yield two molecules of vitamin A. But as you see here, sometimes the cleavage occurs at other points as well, so that one molecule of beta carotene may yield only one molecule of vitamin A. Furthermore, not all beta carotene is converted to vitamin A, talked about that, and absorption of beta carotene is not as efficient as that of vitamin A. For these reasons, 12 micrograms of beta carotene is equivalent to one microgram of vitamin A in nutritional value. Conversion of other carotenoids to vitamin A is even less efficient. 
So just, just you know, I, I, that's why I like vitamin A better. Now, uh, so globally, I, I had a student from Ethiopia that part, part of his job was uh, twice a year. They would go around to different villages and they would give children especially, but I think everyone, really high doses of vitamin A. So the cool thing about vitamin A, since it's stored, um, a, a couple of pills a year, I mean, costing maybe a quarter a piece, can prevent some serious, serious problems that we'll look at in just a little bit. Um, so bi vitamin A is the way to go. If those two, if those two doses were beta carotene, that conversion would be so inefficient that I wouldn't trust it would have the same impact. Hey, nothing wrong with carrots. I'm not, I'm not saying there is, but uh, when in doubt, I recommend getting, getting nutrients in the form our body needs them and not asking for these types of conversions to take place. All right, so the conversion, speaking of the devil, uh, so we have the retinoids that come from animal foods and, they're, and they become retinols, which support reproduction, which can then become retinols, which participate in vision, and retinoic acid regulates growth. If you eat carotenoids, then they start off as those retinols, but then they can become either. So in the, as long as you have good conversion and you're getting more than enough, then beta carotene should be all that you need. But there's just a few ifs and buts there. All right, reflection questions. You can pause and try to answer these yourself. And then fat-soluble vitamins differ from water-soluble vitamins in that one, they require bile for digestion and absorption. So that's why you need fat. The more, you know, the more fat in a meal, the more likely you are to have the bile you need to uh, properly digest and absorb your fat-soluble vitamins. Number two, they travel through the lymphatic system. So remember, they're going to be they're going to be captured with your long-chain fats. Um, in the my cells and carried in the body, travel through your lymphatic system, and then be transported through the blood. Number three, excesses are stored in the liver and adipose tissue. So that's that's a huge difference between, compared to water soluble vitamins. So since they're stored, you don't have to eat them on a regular basis. And then also, number four, they are not readily excreted. This increases the risk of toxicity. So since they are stored, and, and um, that means that you are more likely to get too much in your system and, and lead to toxicities. So that doesn't, I mean, that's almost always supplementation or diets that have way too much of certain foods in them. It's not, not common to see toxicities, but it would be more common here than with the water soluble vitamins because with the water soluble vitamins, the excess is lost in your urine. All right, roles of vitamin A in the body. So we talked about vitamin A in vision. It helps maintain a clear cornea, which is the transparent portion, portion of the eye, which, which you need for light to travel to the back of the eye. It helps convert light energy to nerve impulses in the retina, which is where these photosensitive cells are. So that's where we rely on vitamin A. If you don't have vitamin A, that's when you will develop night blindness. All right, so, and then just, we, we use it, so it has to be replenished, which is why you need it, or at least beta carotene in your diet. Um, this shouldn't say physical activity. I don't know why it does, but it's just it's just showing how we need how we need vitamin A so to um, to actually trigger the electrical impulses that allow us to see. So without vitamin A, this is why blindness is a very sadly very common and very serious consequence of vitamin A deficiency globally. You won't see it much, you know, here, but globally it's a major major issue. All right, the next major function of vitamin A is in protein synthesis and cell differentiation. So you see here, uh, it affects epithelial cells lining the outside and inside of your body especially. So epithelial cells on the outside of your body will form your skin. They also line the inside of your body, forming what are called your mucous membranes. This would be like your respiratory tract, uh, gastrointestinal tract, etc. So vitamin A maintains healthy cells in the mucous membrane. And you see here that without vitamin A, the normal structure and function of the cells in the mucous membrane are impaired. So that's not good, right? You don't, you don't have, um, your mucous membrane won't have the mucus that it needs and the cell lining won't be good. And the cell lining is very important because just like your skin is a barrier on the outside, mucous membranes are a barrier on the inside to pathogens and toxins and things that could get into your body. So not good. And then you see here goblet cells are the cells that synthesize and secrete mucus. And then vitamin A in reproduction and growth. It's needed for sperm development, normal fetal development, uh, growth of children, including bone remodeling. I have a gnat flying in front of me. And, and also it has antioxidant functions, which means that it can stabilize free radicals before they do more damage in your body. So here we see um, the consequences of vitamin A deficiency. The picture here is showing, uh, so you'll see here, if you don't have enough vitamin A, that causes uh, keratinization of the skin, which we, we, we need keratin, but uh, you don't want too much of it. And that, that generally is what's gonna occur on your skin. In the GI tract, not having enough vitamin A is gonna impact mucus production, which we need that barrier. That's what keeps the trillions of microbes and, uh, away from our immune system, where we don't, we don't want them to have this big interaction. Uh, the extreme of this condition is called hyperkeratinization, or usually I call it hyperkeratosis, 
When keratin accumulates around hair follicles, the condition is known as follicular hyperkeratosis. So vitamin deficiency, huge problem in developing countries. Uh, a lot in a lot of countries, they don't eat animal products. They're eating a, maybe they're eating a lot of carotenoids, but with low fat diets, so there's the absorption is impaired, and then people are clearly just you know malnutrition and starvation across the board. Um, Vitamin A status, you know, it should if we have if you have excess, it can be stored in the liver. That's why a couple of huge doses a year can stave off most of these deficiency problems. Um, you'll see here that vitamin you, you need protein in order to for most of vitamin A's functions to actually occur. So someone can maybe be getting a decent amount of vitamin A in their diet, but if they're protein malnourished, then that will cause problems. So what are the big consequences of vitamin A deficiency? So you see the first one, risk of infectious diseases. I already mentioned that let's say that a, a severe vitamin A deficiency might impair your immune system function by 30% or more. I mean, that's a huge number. It's a di this difference between getting sick and not getting sick. It's a difference between dying and not dying. Uh, night blindness and then so like in the US you might see someone with a minor deficiency that has night blindness but it leads to true blindness as well right I, it's hard to get the ex exact numbers but you could be looking at a couple hundred thousand plus people going blind um, and then death vitamin a, severe vitamin a deficiency c kills lots of people so there's a uh, uh, globally this is a serious issue thankfully programs like the one I mentioned earlier with the high dose supplementation is helping but this is still a serious serious problem it's not the most common nutrient deficiency on the planet, but it is it is one of the most serious for sure. On the flip side, what happens if you get too much vitamin A? Um, and this is something that, you know, definitely they talk about uh, uh, not getting too much vitamin A when you're pregnant, and how it can lead to spontaneous abortion and things like that. Uh, you, I don't I don't want anyone to get too much vitamin A. This is one of the reasons that I actually put a limit. If people like eat, eating organ meats, which they are the most nutrient dense food on the planet, in my opinion, um, then I, I usually say definitely no more than a pound a week. I mean, even that would be would be would be quite a bit. Um, so what happens? How does this develop? Vitamin A toxicity develops when binding proteins are loaded. That means this excess vitamin A can can start to damage our cells. So when can we develop toxicity? And it really and again with certain diets like a diet high in organ meats, this is possible. And the same thing with supplementation, right? A lot of people are supplementing with really high doses of fat soluble vitamins now. They're using cod liver oil and plus they're eating liver and things like that. So preformed vitamin A from animal sources, plus fortified foods, plus supplements, and especially in children, that's a that's a potentially toxic combination. Can lead to, to bone defects as well. All right, so how do we find vitamin A? Well, it depends on what we're looking for here. So you see here the colors of vitamin A foods, dark leafy green, rich yellow, or deep orange, that's gonna be the carotenoid. So that would be the where you'd find the beta carotene that can be converted to vitamin A. Uh, vitamin A, I've mentioned liver several times. Because vitamin A is stored in the liver of animals, it is a, a phenomenal source of, of vitamin A. And that's also why you don't see it as much now as you used to, but people use cod liver oil as a way to get the fat soluble vitamins as well. Golden rice and biofortified foods. So golden rice is a genetically modified rice. that I think they use genes from like daffodils and a few other places, but um, Golden rice is a rice that has beta carotene in it. So it's been genetically modified to do that. And it's pretty neat. Uh, it's a brilliant idea. It hasn't worked as well as people hoped. You know, there's cost issues, but then we also have the issue of getting it to people. They're consuming beta carotene, but is there any fat with that meal? If they're just consuming the rice, how are they going to absorb the beta carotene well? These, you know, these are issues. That's why I like the high dose supplementation campaigns. I think they work better than using something like a genetically modified rice. All right, um, how much do we need? We mentioned, we mentioned it earlier, the 5,000 international units. Uh, it can also be expressed as retinol activity equivalents. That would be primarily in food. Supplementation is where you see the IU or international units. Uh, food sources, I mentioned my list, but here we see some. You got what, beef liver, sweet potatoes, uh, really off the charts there. Carrots being another really good one. So, uh, But just keep in mind that are you getting the preformed vitamin A or are you getting the uh, beta carotene? All right, vitamin D, moving on. So most people have talked, uh, heard a lot about vitamin D over the last decade or so. And when I was in college, which has been over 20, yeah, about, right about 20 years ago now I graduated. When I was in college, vitamin D increased calcium absorption, which it still does, but we now know it has just you know dozens and hundreds of other functions. Uh, vitamin D is linked to thousands of genes. It impacts the gene expression of thousands of genes. Genes, hundreds of those genes are on your white blood cells, so we know that's big role in immunity, uh, autoimmunity, et cetera, et cetera. Like just countless, uh, countless reasons why you need vitamin D. Now I don't think it's the miracle that people thought it was either. 
That's why some of the vitamin D supplementation studies have been, you know, just not not as effective as people hoped. I think that you want to make sure you're getting plenty of vitamin D. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think that it's probably best to get it from sunlight when possible, just because as vitamin D is produced uh, from sunlight, it leads to a lot of cool metabolites that probably impact our health uh, in many positive ways that we don't understand yet. So, but getting enough, not being deficient is certainly important. But if you are deficient in vitamin D, the big question is why, right? Is there an underlying reason why, or are you just not, not consuming it or not making it? I don't know. Okay, um, so vitamin D, its active form is a hormone. So really calling it vitamin D is a, doesn't do it justice. It is a hormone. It is essential for making and maintaining bones. So that's still the, the primary thing we think about, but we know it does so much more. It assists in the absorption uh, of calcium and phosphorus. So also really important for bone. Uh, it's important for brain and nerve cells. So it does appear to protect against cognitive decline. And it regulates adipose cells to influence obesity development. So it looks like, uh, uh, again, being deficient in vitamin D could increase your risk of being obese. All right, where does it, how do we actually make it? So you see on the right-hand side, we can get it from the diet. The plant form is called vitamin D2. The animal form is vitamin D3, which is better. Uh, the, the, as far as your body making it, so, in, so you, you have this compound called 7-dehydrocholesterol which is a precursor made in the liver from cholesterol. Then when UV light from the sun strikes that, it forms pre-vitamin D3, which long fancy metabolic pathways becomes vitamin D3. Then that goes to the liver, where it becomes calcidiol. Then it goes to the kidneys, where it becomes calcitriol. So it's a pretty complicated process. But very, very cool. So, so we, you do need that, that cholesterol precursor in order to make it. Now, the key here, though, is how powerful are the sun's rays where you're at at any given time of year. So how much of your skin is exposed? So you, are you outside fully clothed? Or are you, do you have your shirt off or something? Uh, what, you know, what time of year is it as far as where you are? Like if you live near the equator, you're probably making it all the time. But here where I'm at in South Dakota, from October to March, the UV rays just aren't powerful enough to make vitamin D. That's why it gets cold, right? Think about it. During the winter, our half of the planet is tilted away from the sun and the sun's rays are traveling a few hundred more miles to get here and that weakens them. So they're not strong enough to make a bunch of vitamin D. During the summer, it's a whole different story. So it's a, where are you at on the planet? What time of year is it? How much skin is exposed? Um, are you wearing sunscreen? So sunscreen's a great idea for preventing skin cancer, but uh, really any sunscreen with an SPF above like eight pretty much shuts off vitamin D production because you need the UV rays to strike the skin and, and to form vitamin D. So I, so I kind of recommend, again, not medical advice, but personally, we do what we like to call smart sun exposure. Go outside, maybe with, without sunscreen for a, a few minutes, and then apply it if we're going to be outside for a long period of time. Uh, so a lot, lot of factors are going to impact vitamin D production. And that's why, but I don't know, like if you ask me, do I need vitamin D? Do I need more? I don't know what to say because there's, there's so many factors that impact how much vitamin D is in your blood. The only real way to know is to test and then deal with it. If, you, if your vitamin D levels are normal, then you're good. If your vitamin D levels are low, then change your diet, change supplement, do those kind of things and, and get those levels up. Uh, and, and, and also, if you're going to test your vitamin D levels, I recommend testing at different times of the year. You know, test in July or August here and then test in January and, and see if there's a huge difference. So pretty cool that you can make it though. All right, a couple questions for you to answer. Fat soluble vitamins differ from, wait, that's almost, that's not what it says up there. Um, we talked about, that's from the last one. There's a few issues with these PowerPoints. I catch them as we go. Almost 10% of Americans are vitamin D deficient. So depending on who you ask, the number would be even higher. List four factors that contribute to deficiency. So here we have dark skin, just because, again, it's the, the, the UV rays striking the skin, being absorbed by the skin, is what um, leads to vitamin D production. Breastfeeding without supplementation. A lack of sunlight, because then you're not making it, and then not consuming fortified milk, because milk's all fortified with vitamin D. Uh, obesity seems to impact this as well. I mean, there's there's lots of other factors. Uh, all the ones I mentioned, are you wearing sunscreen? How much are you outside? What part of the planet are you on? Et cetera, et cetera. Like, um, so you could make an argument that vitamin D and then a few other things like folic, uh, folic acid destruction are really what determines skin color. So if you look at, you can look at a map of the planet and skin color, basically the closer your genes are, or genes came from the equator, the darker your skin and then and skin got lighter and lighter and lighter as we as, as a species traveled away from the equator. So not always, but like, yeah, the pe you know, people, that, people whose genes are from Scandinavia are going to have lighter skin than people whose genes are from the equator. There are exceptions to those rules. Like if you look at the Inuit, for example, but that's because their skin never had to get lighter and lighter 
uh, to increase vitamin D production because they were consuming it. They're a diet really high in seafood, so they were eating it. So there was really no evolutionary advantage to having lighter skin when it came to vitamin D production. So that's really what skin color is, right? We talk about that a lot in anatomy, but it's really just a response to um, balancing vitamin D production from whatever part of the planet your genes lived in, you know, in your ancestors. And then also uh, the lighter skin, though, leading to issues with folic acid, folate destruction. So that's, that's you know, sadly, skin has led to terrible, terrible things. And, uh, but that's really what it is, right? From an evolutionary standpoint, it is a, it is trying to maintain homeostasis on different parts of the planet. All right. Uh, a vitamin D deficiency sub subsequently causes a calcium deficiency because the key, one of the key things vitamin D does is it leads to the absorption of calcium. Remember we said earlier, you're not what you eat, you're what you absorb. And if you, it doesn't matter how much calcium you're consuming, if you're so vitamin D deficient that you're not absorbing it. All right, so what happens with a vitamin D deficiency? Besides some of these other you know, chronic health issues, the big ones are bone related. So uh, if you're vitamin D deficient, the production of calbindin and osteocalcin and a few other ones slows when deficient. This can result in rickets in children. So the rickets and osteomalacia are the same condition, just uh, rick rickets happens in children and osteomalacia in adults. Rickets is rare in the United States, but can affect more than half of the children in some countries. So depending on diet and then where, how much sun exposure they get, the bones fail to calcify normally. Now, if you're an adult and you become vitamin D deficient, you will develop osteomalacia, which means soft bones. Bones become soft, flexible, brittle, and deformed. So, very, so really the two sides of the same coin. Rickets, just remember, think kids. Osteomalacia, think adults. If it gets even worse, then you have osteoporosis, where your bones get so weak that it impacts your activities of daily living and can result in fractures. Deficiencies are especially likely in the elderly. So sadly, the group that is already at highest risk of falling and, and weak bones is also at highest risk for vitamin D deficiency. And this could be because maybe, uh, like I know my, my grandmother, as she got older, she didn't go outside very much. She had rheumatoid arthritis, so she was pretty limited in her movement. So she spent a huge part of her day sitting in a recliner inside. So she was, so she was more likely to have issues than someone that's outside on a, daily, on a regular basis. All right, vitamin D toxicity on the other end. So the most likely of the the vitamins to have toxic effects when consumed in excessive amounts. And this can happen because people have heard that vitamin D is so good for them that they're constantly looking for ways to, mainly with supplements, you know, taking a bunch of supplements. Uh, so it raises, so vitamin D toxicity raises blood calcium concentrations, which can cause calcification of tissues that you don't want to calcify. It can form stones in soft tissues. It can harden your blood vessels. Uh, you know, about usually about 25% of the plaque that's in an artery is calcium. That's why we can see them on x-rays and you can do like those calcium scores. They're actually measuring the calcium in your blood vessels. Well, if you, if you have a toxic level of vitamin D, you'll see more of that. So it can lead to death. All right, so supplementation. Vitamin D is found in multivitamin and mineral supplements, and then also high dose single supplements. Uh, personally, we use, uh, we use drops uh, from Carlson's, or they're, they're called, so vitamin D drops. Um, and, and the supplements are usually that make sure if you, if you take a supplement, make sure it's the D3 form, the, the more effective form. All right, so match these. Affects children and causes bones to bend. That's rickets. Uh, number two, reduced ability to activate and make vitamin D, the elderly. So they're, that's why they're increased deficiency risk. Number three, fractures often result from calcium loss from bones. That's osteoporosis. Uh, if you just have weakening bones, but there's no like clinical issues, that's called osteopenia. Uh, affects adults, poor mineralization, causes soft brittle bones, that would be osteomalacia. In what ways does vitamin D protect against disease? This is a very, very, very long list. Um, so I'll, I'll read what they have here though. This is all good stuff. In the brain and nerve cells, vitamin D protects against cognitive decline and slows the progression of Parkinson's disease. Vitamin D in muscle cells encourages growth in children and preserves strength in adults, so that's always good news. Vitamin D signals the cells of the immune system to defend against infectious diseases, so that's why I put it way up on my list of immune-enhancing nutrients, uh, along with vitamin A and zinc, those are my big ones. Uh, vitamin D may also regulate the cells of the adipose tissue in ways that might influence the development of obesity. Again, you're seeing a lot of mites, right? A lot, lot more research needs done to really hammer down all these things, but it's all... It's all trending in the right direction, I would say. In many cases, vitamin D enhances or suppresses the activity of genes that regulate cell growth. So I mentioned earlier that thousands, 3,000 or more genes are regulated by vitamin D. Hundreds of those are on your white blood cells, which is back to that immune system function. This is why vitamin D 
really kind of modulates things, like modulates the immune system. What I mean by that is it doesn't always make the immune system stronger or weaker. It just makes it function better, I guess. Uh, recent research suggests that vitamin D may protect against heart disease, type 2 diabetes, inflammation, brain disorders, macular degeneration, hypertension, and some cancers. I've seen it linked to decreases in, in, in 15 cancers or so. Lots and lots of good stuff. But this doesn't mean that more is always better. Make sure you're not deficient. Make sure you have optimal amount of vitamin D in your body, but that doesn't mean that more is better. All right, vitamin E. So halfway through the fat cell vitamins, vitamin E is an antioxidant. That's the main reason that, that people have talked about it over the decades. So there are, there are two different subgroups called the tocopherols and the tocotrienols. And then each of those has four different sub subgroups, I guess, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. So there are, there are eight different versions of vitamin E. But the one we care about is alpha tocopherol. That's the one that's maintained in your body. And that's the one that when you see vitamin, D, vitamin E added to food or in supplements, it's almost always the alpha tocopherol form. So it is an antioxidant. We've talked about how it neutralizes or stops chain reactions of free radicals. Remember, free radicals, they form chain reactions because I'm a free radical. I'm unstable because I'm missing an electron. So I'm going to steal one from you. But now you're unstable because you're missing an electron. And now you have to do the same and the same. So it stops that chain reaction from occurring. You'll see here that so vitamin E is the most important lipid soluble antioxidant. So it's going to impact lipids primarily. So you see that it protects your cells and their cell membranes because they're made of lipids. It protects the brain and also protects you from heart disease because it protects your LDL cholesterols, those lipoproteins that are carrying fat and cholesterol. And when, a, when an LDL cholesterol becomes oxidized, it is much more likely to stick to your blood vessel walls, be driven into your blood vessel walls, and form a plaque. So this is all, all good news. That's not good news. But the fact that vitamin A protects you from that is the good news. So what happens with vitamin E deficiency? So primary deficiencies are rare, and that's because vitamin E is in all of your all of your vegetable oils and then all the foods made from them they add vitamin e there to try to stabilize the fat that's in your corn oil canola oil etc so really anytime you're eating something that uh that was made with an oil you're getting some vitamin e so you're kind of supplementing with it as you go so not getting enough in your diet is pretty rare so that means primary deficiencies are rare you're, you're probably eating it Secondary deficiencies are more common. And remember, a secondary deficiency means you're, get, you're eating it, but it's not being digested, absorbed, stored, utilized. So anything that affects the absorption of fat is going to affect the absorption of your fat cell vitamins. When I, go back, I, when I was back in college, um, that was when Olean and Olestra, these fat replacers are really common. Well, all those foods, I remember there being like a, a reduced fat Dorito. And all the, there was Pringles, all these kind of foods. And they, they don't use them much anymore because when fat passes through you without being digested, it leads to GI problems, gas, bloating, diarrhea. So people didn't like them. But um, they had to add fat cell vitamins to those foods because those fat replacers were impacting the absorption of your fat cell vitamins. So anything that impacts your ability to digest and absorb fat will also impact these. All right, so what happens if you have a vitamin E deficiency? So the most common one we talk about is called erythrocyte hemolysis, meaning that the, your red blood cells will, will split or tear apart, where your red blood cells will break open. So that's the most common deficiency, uh, vitamin E deficiency. They can lead to neuromuscular issues as well, but the, the blood cell one's the big one to remember. Well, how about the other side? When If you get too much vitamin E or vitamin E toxicity, uh, it is rare because you need really high doses. This really, really would only come with high doses of supplementation. As you can see here, the UL or the tolerable upper intake level is 65 times greater than the R recommended intake for adults. So you'd need, you'd need to be supplementing, but that people do that and some people do that. So extremely high doses of vitamin E, the main thing they do is they kind of, they thin the blood, which is great in smaller doses, but if you have excessive amounts, it can interfere with vitamin K activity and vitamin K is needed for blood clotting. So it, it can lead to um, some bleeding issues. All right, so vitamin E recommendations. Let me go to these lists here. So I talked about vitamin E being a powerful fat-soluble antioxidant. It plays a crucial role in protecting cell membranes, LDL cholesterol, and the brain. It's used in cooking oils to slow the rancidity process. We talked about the forms. So good food sources that I put on my list were almonds, sunflower seeds, and leafy green vegetables. Uh, I think that's, that's everything I need, that's everything I have there. Let's see what the FDA page has for vitamin E. It's an antioxidant, helps with the formation of blood vessels and immune function. 30 international units are what your goal should be. 
and you find them fortified cereals and juices, green vegetables like spinach and broccoli, nuts and seeds, peanuts and peanut butter, and vegetable oils. All right, the RDA is based on the alpha tocopherol form only because that's the one that's maintained in the human body. Vitamin E is widespread in food. Much of the dietary vitamin E comes from vegetable oils or foods containing them. So I don't know how I don't know how many how 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 much vegetable oil you're consuming, but even even if someone's trying to minimize exposure to vegetable oil, they're still getting uh, meeting the the needs. Vitamin E is destroyed by oxidation and heat. Therefore, fresh foods are preferred sources. All right, last one, vitamin K. So I like to look at vitamin K like two separate things. So when I just say vitamin K, I'm generally talking about what's called vitamin K1, but there is a vitamin K2 that we will, we will talk about separately. And you see, and you see both the, the functions on here. So the primary action of vitamin K is blood clotting. You see here, it leads to the formation of prothrombin. So if you look at the, the clotting factors when it comes to blood clotting, like in your anatomy class, you'll see that most of those clotting factor proteins are vitamin K dependent. They need vitamin K. So you see here that vitamin K leads to prothrombin, which is an inactive protein that when it becomes thrombin is now the enzyme that actually lets your blood clot because the blood clotting cascade leads to fibrinogen, which is a water-soluble protein, becoming fibrin, which is an insoluble protein, and that's why you form a clot. So without vitamin K, you can't make prothrombin, which turns into thrombin, which means that you can't get a blood clot to actually form. So vitamin K, first function you should think of is blood clotting. But the metabolism of bone proteins is also really important. Uh, you see here this osteocalcin, that's the most important one. So if you're not getting enough vitamin K, and especially this vitamin K2, uh, which you primarily find, find in fermented foods, or it's also called the uh, grass-fed uh, vitamin because you find it in more, more in, in dairy products and cheeses and stuff from grass-fed animals than grain-fed animals. But uh, vitamin K2, you can get it from eggs. It's, there's a lot of it in egg yolks as well. But vitamin K2, it activates the proteins that actually take calcium from the blood and put it into your bones. So it does. So vitamin K, especially that K2 form, does play a big role in the metabolism of bone proteins. So if you don't have enough vitamin K, then these proteins like osteocalcin will not be functioning at 100% and your bones will not get as dense as they should. The other big issue here is, and in class we'll talk more about this, but... Um, if the calcium doesn't go into your bones where it's supposed to, where does it go? It, this is where it ends up in your soft tissues, especially your blood vessels. So lots and lots of studies show that getting enough vitamin K2 reduces cardiovascular disease risk because a quarter or more of the plaque in your blood vessels is calcium. If that calcium is being driven into your bones, it's not going to be driven into the plaque in your arteries. So that's that's a we could talk for hours about that, but that's that's a really big deal. So making sure you're getting plenty of vitamin K, very important for blood clotting. Also very important for bone density, but also very important for making sure that calcium doesn't deposit in your soft tissues. And that's the other possible roles of vitamin K. All right, vitamin K deficiencies and toxicities. Primary would be just from an inadequate dietary intake, which is rare, especially if you're consuming plenty of green leafy vegetables. But I do, do recommend, you know, you know, if you're looking for, uh, so fermented foods, uh, egg yolks, uh, grass-fed cheeses, these are a good idea if you really want to ramp up your, your intake of, of vitamin K. You can also supplement with it, especially that K2 form. You can get you can actually supplement with a form that's been produced by bacteria. All right, um, so secondary deficiency, this would be because of the microbiome. If antibodies in your, from your immune system kill off the vitamin K producing bacteria in your gut, then that could lead to a problem because up to half of the vitamin K you're gonna you're gonna absorb today could could come from your gut bacteria. Then you see fa failure failure of bowel production that would be that secondary malabsorption again. If you're not digesting and absorbing fat, then your vitamin K is not gonna come in come along for the ride. Infants, so they have a sterile gut, they don't have any vitamin K producing bacteria. That's why when a baby is born, almost always, they're given an injection of vitamin K. Their their microbiome is not not making vitamin K yet. And that's why if you ever had a baby, you know their first few poops aren't really like poops because they don't have a microbiome yet. All right, so toxicity, not common. Um, no adverse effects with high intakes. There is no tolerable upper intake level, but high doses can reduce the effectiveness of anticoagulant drugs. So if you're on a blood clotting, you know, blood clotting medication or anticoagulant, then work with your doctor about vitamin K intake. All right, what are the non-food sources of vitamin K? 
Are they sufficient in meeting the needs of the average human? And what food sources can provide vitamin K? So the non-food sources of vitamin K are synthesized by intestinal bacteria. However, the amount is insufficient to meet the needs and bioavailability is limited. So we don't know, like everyone's microbiome is different. So everyone's gonna be getting a different dose of vitamin K every day from their gut bacteria. So you can't rely on that for all of it. Like I said, up to half maybe, but I wouldn't rely on it. So food sources of vitamin K include leafy greens like kale and spinach, fruits such as avocado and kiwi, and vegetable oils. So this is where, so leafy green vegetables, great place to get vitamin K1. When, let's say a cow, when a cow eats leafy greens like grass, they will convert it into vitamin K2, and then, then that's the kind of vitamin K you'll find in, their, um, in their, their dairy, like in their cheese. This is why grass-fed cheeses are really good sources of vitamin K. Um, same thing with chickens, right? Chickens are gonna be rooting around and eating weeds and flowers and stuff like that. Um, and that's why a really healthy animal that's been outside eating bugs and these kind of things, they'll have plenty of vitamin K2 in, their, in the yolks of their eggs. So I would say for a typical person's diet, Leafy green vegetables, best place to get the vitamin K1. Um, and then the grass-fed cheeses or egg yolks would be a great place to get the vitamin K2. So what else do I have here? I talked about the two forms, K1, primarily blood clotting, K2, bone and blood vessel health. Uh, vitamin K1 is easy to find in green leafy veggies. Vitamin K2 is much harder to find, I put now at least. It is only found in animal products, from grass-fed animals especially. Uh, so grass-fed ghee, grass-fed butter, grass-fed cheeses. Uh, the best source by far on the planet, though, is a fermented food called natto, which is fermented soybeans. Uh, that's probably got a thousand uh, micrograms of, of vitamin K2 in it. If you've ever had it, it's uh, basically soybeans. They traditionally they put them in a burlap sack and they kind of went bad, right, as they fermented, and that became natto. So natto and eggs would be a relatively common breakfast traditionally in Japan, as far as I know. Uh, much of the vitamin K that you use is produced by good bacteria in the large intestine, so gut health. That's the last thing I have there. What's the FDA site say? Vitamin K needed for blood clotting and strong bones. Where is it found? Green vegetables like broccoli, kale, spinach, turnip greens, collards, Swiss chard, and mustard greens. And we need 80 micrograms of it a day. All right. So that's it, we've been through, so we covered the main roles, deficiency symptoms, and food sources for vitamins A, D, E, and K, your four fat soluble vitamins. I hope this helps, I'll come back and cover, uh, we have two more chapters covering the major minerals and then the trace minerals coming up. So I hope this helps, have a wonderful day, be blessed.